On July 17, 1987, in Baltimore, Maryland, Yardley Love was born. And right away, she was a force to be reckoned with. From her enormous heart to her contagious smile, you couldn't help but feel joy in Yardley's presence. In 2006, Yardley started college at the University of Virginia, where she played for the women's lacrosse team. Four short years later, in May 2010, Yardley Love's life came to a shattering halt. Yardley's former boyfriend forced his way into her apartment and brutally beat her to death. The Baltimore native's body was discovered face down on the bed in her college apartment. The murder sent shockwaves throughout the school. Hundreds gathered to mourn the lacrosse player's death, aware that they sat near the spot on the lawn where Love was supposed to accept her diploma in three weeks. Devastated by the loss of Yardley, her family created One Love, a foundation that educates young people about the difference between healthy and unhealthy relationships so that they may seek help before an abusive relationship escalates to violence. I love the fact that it keeps Yardley's memory alive in such a positive way. And I love the fact that we hear feedback from so many people that have gotten out of a dangerous relationship because of us. And I honestly feel that we're saving lives. Because here's the sad truth. Yardley Love was killed and her death was avoidable. If only anyone in her life, including her, understood the visible yet often misunderstood signs of an unhealthy relationship. This is why One Love works to make sure others have the information that Yardley, her friends, and her family did not. Because unfortunately, Yardley's story is more common than most people realize. In fact, more than one in three women and more than one in four men will experience relationship violence in his or her lifetime. One Love aims to not only bring awareness to these unacceptable statistics, but to ultimately change them. Our workshop, Escalation, is a 90-minute workshop that we're taking to college campuses, and it's focused on educating young people about what relationship abuse is, and then empowering them to make change in their communities. You've just watched this very powerful fictional depiction, and all of a sudden, there's this giant reminder that this is very, very real. The workshop has been so successful since it started on college campuses in 2015 that One Love is now taking it to high schools and communities across the country. It's really going to spark a conversation on a topic that hasn't been talked about. One Love also connects with young people online by releasing videos that show what the problem looks like, sounds like, and how easily it can be hidden behind seemingly kind words. Because I love you. Skip class with me. Let's stay in bed today. You were walking with Mark? Because I love you. This Jason number? Delete. And, and Ben? Delete. That's not love. Through compelling workshops and emotionally powerful content, One Love has started more than a conversation. It's inspired nationwide partnerships, activated community events, and empowered young people everywhere. What began with one family in one place has spread to an entire country and started a movement. But One Love's work is nowhere near complete. Not until every community across the country is equipped with the tools to step up and speak out. <laughs> so join One Love, and together let's educate others about the signs of unhealthy relationships so that we can build stronger communities and change lives. Hello everyone and thank you so much for tuning in today. On this episode of Girls Who Run the World podcast, I am interviewing the one, the only, Katie Hood. Katie Hood is the CEO of the One Love Foundation. The One Love Foundation is a national nonprofit organization with the goal of ending relationship abuse. They empower young people with the tools and resources they need to see the signs of healthy and unhealthy relationships. Katie is changing the world one person at a time, and under her leadership, One Love has become the nation's leading educator on the topic of healthy and unhealthy relationships. I am thrilled to be here today and to be interviewing such a strong, powerful woman that is changing the world in such a profound way. Thank you so much for joining us, Katie, and I cannot wait to hear your story. Thank you for having me. I'm happy <laughs> yeah. to be here with you. I'm so excited. Um, so first, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So uh, I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, so, um, and was the oldest of three kids. Um, 
went to public school, Catholic school for through eighth grade, public school for high school, and then I went to Duke University for college, where I thought I would be a doctor. I thought I was I was going to be pre med, and then I realized I was never going to get into medical school because I was not quite up for the <laughs> biology chemistry challenge. But um, changed my major to public policy because I was really interested in solutions focus, like public policy policy is all about identifying problems and then figuring out how you solve them with policy. Loved that major, um, was involved as a student leader at Duke, um, and then just went through my career, not really knowing exactly what I wanted to do, but knowing that I wanted to be in a job that I felt like really was a fit for me. Right. Um, and when I was growing up, I don't think I had a really strong sense of the range of opportunities that were out there. I thought you could be like a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a secretary, whatever. And really the path starting in my 20s to start exploring who I was and what I wanted to do okay. and be really, that's when it started for me. Yeah. So how did you get involved with all, like when you were, were, were working at like Goldman Sands and then Michael J. Fox Foundation? Yeah. Like so that. my first job was at Goldman Sachs. It was... Um, Goldman Sachs. Sorry. Yeah, Goldman Sachs. Fine. It, it was... So that's a really funny story. So I didn't know how to get a job. Um, but back in the old days, you, they had this thing called resume drop where it was hard copy resumes, by the way. There was no emailing your resume to anyone. But but they would co- companies would come in, they would set up boxes for different companies. I didn't know the first thing about investment banking. I, I just knew I needed to get a job and I didn't know how to get one. Right. I wasn't a very good networker at all but back in the day. It was harder to network though because you didn't have the internet. You couldn't find people. It was like, but long story short, I just dropped resumes um, and got a job in the credit department at Goldman Sachs. And the funny thing about it is I didn't even really know what I was going to be doing. I was just so relieved to have a job. Mm -hmm. And so many people at Duke were like, wait, they hired you? Because they they were a top employer. And I had like no finance, no econ. I think they hired me because I'd been a, a leader and I, and I was mm-hmm. really good at working with teams and they wanted, you know, when you're a banker, you work really long hours. <laughs> so they like people that can are smart enough to do the work, but also a good person to have around late at night. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got that job. I knew within, within months that it was not the right fit for me. Um, but because so many people have been like, I can't believe they gave you a job. I was like determined to get through the analyst program. Yeah. So I made it through my two years there um, and was a little bit lost afterwards. I thought, investment banking now equaled business to me. So I said, oh, I'm not interested in business. Now that's actually not true. There's a Mm -hmm. lot of different kinds of businesses, but I only had one experience. So I thought maybe I wanted to be a professor. And I went back to Duke and I worked at a leadership program um, for students. I had been really inspired by one professor in the public policy department who honestly believed in me before I believed in myself. And I thought maybe that's what I want to be for other people. Like he had such a profound influence on my life. Uh, but then, like, rinse and repeat, within a month of being back there, I was like, oh, this isn't for me. Um, and I was like, it's too slow. Like, I, I'd come from this urgent investment banking culture to a place where it was like, come in at 9, leave at 4.59. If it doesn't get done today, it'll get done tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And I realized, like, that's against my nature. That's yeah. not the way I operate. So I started, um, I'd intended to move back there and be there for a long time, um, but I started applying to business school. So I went to business school. I got into Harvard Business School, which is a funny story because I never thought I would get in there. I thought I was a shoe in for the Kennedy School, which was a school of government up there. I got rejected out of hand by the Kennedy School and I got into the business school. So So there I ended (laughs) up. So um, after business, I met my husband in business school. we moved to New York, even though I swore I did not want to live in New York. He wanted to be a banker. We are very different people. Um, and I did consulting. We moved back a month before September 11th. Okay. So in every way, again, yet again, within a couple months, I realized this is not what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I loved the company I worked for, which was Bain. I loved the people there. But when the Twin Towers came down, um, I just had this overwhelming, like, if I had been in them, would I be happy with what I'm doing? Like, is this, if, if wow. this, if my life were going to be over, am I doing what I'd want to be doing? Mm-hmm. Um, and so basically I decided I needed to leave. I didn't, again, know how to find a job really, but I just started calling some folks I considered mentors. Um, I said, I think I either want to go to a company where I have more time to volunteer because I wanted something related to service. Mm-hmm. Or I think I want to go to a nonprofit, but I'm afraid of the bureaucracy of nonprofits. I'm afraid of slow moving things. Yeah. 
And um, so that's how I found my way to the Michael J. Fox Foundation, which was um, a startup at the time. I joined in 2002 uh, and was there until 2011. Um, I played, it was a startup, which meant I played every, I played lots of different roles. The business was growing. I had an opportunity to really help Mm -hmm. figure out what we were going to do to make a difference and cure Parkinson's, worked with amazing people, um, and ultimately was the CEO there for the last three and a half years that I was there. Um, so, so Michael J. Fox was incredible because it was just like, we had to figure it out. I remember when I got hired, she said, our goal is to cure Parkinson's. This was Debbie Brooks, who was my mentor. Okay. And we don't know how we're going to do it. We just need smart people on board to figure it out. And so I loved it. And, and, and interestingly, coming full circle, I feel like I got like my PhD in Parkinson's science. So I was back to sort of the biology and pre-med stuff. Right. But now I was bringing a different expertise, which is how do we create a better way of funding research and how okay. do we figure out what's best for patients' needs? And so it was a really, that was like my professional boot camp, I would say, is the yeah. time that I spent there. Okay, that's awesome. And do you think that, so when you, which I think it's a bold, like a powerful thing that you said when the Twin Towers fell down, you took a moment to think, oh, is this, am I happy with what I'm doing? Like, am I fulfilled? Is my job fulfilling me? Or am I doing what I'm passionate about? So do you think after that is where you really found your passion for philanthropy? Uh, I think, so I would say that... Um, I think the reason I very, I've been very blessed with a strong gut instinct Mm -hmm. about what's for me and not, which sadly led to me starting jobs and being like, oh my gosh, I want out of here like a month (laughs) in. But, but, but I actually think it was, it led me to take more experiments early so that I found what I love to do um, faster. I think that 9-11 after just being, I mean, my office was in Times Square. We were literally watching out the window And wondering if the next plane was coming to Times Square, which Mm -hmm. the whole thing was so crazy. So after I got over the fear and the shock of that uh, that week, I just sort of, I don't know, I sort of, I said, I always felt like I wanted to do a job where not only was I the best person for the job, but it was the best suited for me. When I was at Goldman, I was neither the best person for the job because I I was fine, but I wasn't, I wasn't the best, most brilliant banker, banking analyst, whatever. And there were a million people behind me who wanted my seat who would have been better. Right. So I wanted to find the place where my unique skills matched up with a need. And I I would say when I think about passion, I wouldn't say I'm passionate for philanthropy. I think I'm passionate for problem solving. Okay. So it was passionate about problem solving. So I love identifying like big things that affect a lot of people, Parkinson's disease, domestic violence and relationship abuse that... You sort of, there's a part of you that wants to go, it's too hard. It's just too hard. But just try to think creatively about what could we do differently. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes me really, that's what I love doing. It's like experimenting, trying new things, figuring out what works. And that's really what I'm passionate about. And I actually am not sure that it would have to be a nonprofit where I would be happy. But I think somewhere where I'm exercising or using that muscle is what I'm passionate about. So could you tell us, like, obviously, I know a little bit about it, but can you tell, like, our listeners about how you got involved with One Love after Michael J. Fox? Sure. So um, so while I was at Michael J. Fox, I had three children. Um, uh, my oldest, Nick, was born in 2005. Finley was born in 2007. And then Griffin was born in 2010. He was born on April 27th. So um, he was a week old, and I was home on maternity leave when I got a call from a friend, an out-of-town friend, who said, you need to go to Sharon because her cousin's been killed. So I grabbed my baby and drove down the hill, and my close friend Sharon Robinson was sitting in the hallway with her small kids around her, and she mouthed the words, he broke down the door and he beat her to death. And she was talking about her cousin Yardley Love. Mm -hmm. So that was a very, talk about a moment where you're just like, I remember I just said, what, what, what? I, you know, I thought in a short drive down to her house, I thought about a car crash. I thought about drugs. I thought about drinking. Yeah. And this possibility wasn't even on my radar. So, um, I, re- I remember that day so well, cause I remember a couple of things that Sharon said, like, um, you know, we, they just had no idea she was at risk. It, it, it's, I think when we see these stories in the media, we think, well, somebody must have known. Somebody, they prob- this had probably been going on for a while. And what I really realized that day is there was a drama-filled relationship, but nobody called it what it was, right? right? Yeah. And as I learned more about the issue, I realized the magnitude of the problem. And honestly, I felt a little bit ashamed 
that I hadn't spent more time thinking about a problem that affects more than one in three women, nearly one in three men, and one in two trans or Mm non-binary people. So I started to just learn more, learn more, learn more. Um, In 2011, and and try to help her family however I can. Mm -hmm. They had an instant desire to honor Yardley's um, memory and not let the bookends on her life be the way that it ended. Mm -hmm. They created a foundation um, and were thinking about what they wanted to do with it. They created the field at NDP in her honor, a scholarship at UVA. um, And I just tried to help advise them from the side on what they could do. Um, So 2011, about a year later, I left Michael J. Fox um, a lot of different reasons. I, I felt like, well, A, my oldest son was really struggling with some stuff and I felt like I was checking the box on parenting. Mm-hmm. Um, I also just, I'd been there when I joined Fox, it was because they had a vision of curing Parkinson's in 10 years, which I was really compelled by, but biology is just hard. It just was taking right. longer. And I wasn't sure if the next part of my life was really going to be in Parkinson's. Mm-hmm. So I left and that meant I had more time to help Sharon, Love, Sharon Robinson, their family, figure out what they wanted to do. Um, I joined as an advisor to the organization. And I I really could see now that there was a giant gap around education. Mm -hmm. Um, Sharon Love said, you know, I knew to talk to her about drinking or drugs or whatever. I did not know to talk to her about abuse. And I think most parents would collectively say that's not something we we all as people collectively like to think that's an issue that doesn't affect us. It's part part, why we, why we've ignored it for so long, I Mm -hmm. think. Um, So anyway, she came out of the trial realizing um, so many different things. You know, a third of the jury pool was dismissed because of a personal connection to abuse. So the stats were suddenly very real and it was Mm -hmm. every kind of person. It's not just one kind of person. Um, She realized that people had seen things, but they didn't know how to talk about it. And she really said, I want to do for this issue what Mothers Against Drunk Driving did for that issue. I want to shift the shame from the abuse to the abuser. Right. And I want to teach bystanders to take away the keys, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. So when she said that, I was like, wow, that's a big vision. So let's talk about what that is. So that's how I got to, um, like, oh, well, then two years later, um, they created a film called Escalation. Right. And I watched and I said, you need to decide how big you want this to be because everybody needs to see that movie. Like I watched the movie and I realized I hadn't understood my friend's relationships before and I'd done the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so they came back to me and said, well, do you want to be the CEO and and run it? And at this point I had left, I had left Michael J. Fox in 2011. Okay. Between 11 and 14, I taught a class called women as leaders at Duke. So I did get to be a professor, which was amazing. That's so fun. Um, But then I came back to work full-time at One Love. Okay. Um, And so my question would be, so, like, as your personal, like, I kind of want to talk about your journey. So, you know, your resume is unbelievable. I mean, like, going to Duke, working at Goldman Sachs, Michael J. Fox, TED TED Talk, TEDx, um, Fortune Most Powerful Women Conference. What do you think led you personally to One Love? Was it the message? Or I know you were talking about how you like problem solving, and this was a huge problem that well, you know, no one I think has there's about. Yeah, I think there's a couple things. I think the first is I was really bowled over that day, May 3rd, 2010, mm-hmm. that this issue that I, I knew existed, but it wasn't really my issue. Suddenly, yeah. my close friend, her family is like, it's their ground zero, right? Mm-hmm. Like, And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so much closer. So it made it personal to me. Right. Um, the magnitude of the problem... I was like, why is nobody talking about it? I remember saying, this is the biggest public health epidemic that nobody is right. talking about. Um, and really, I joined One Love because of the power of the solution. So mm-hmm. they created this film, and I was like, oh my gosh, people can learn so fast. If we create films that show people right. what unhealthy or abusive behaviors yeah. look like, people are going to recognize their lives because... It, because we call these things unhealthy plays up in every every one of us has been in an unhealthy relationship, but a lot of us have been in emotionally abusive relationships too. But people need to see it with the label attached to it to be like, oh my gosh, this is my issue too. Right. Um, so I think I joined partly because I was ready to build something again. I love to build. Mm-hmm. I saw a path, um, which is nobody is in this prevention space in a big way. Nobody has tried to. Create. Sharon Love used to say, I want to talk to kids in a language they can hear. That was film. That was peer-to-peer conversation. So I was just really excited about trying to build something that could 
save lives. You know, like yeah. if if a kid and we, the, this is the thing. I mean, can, we get countless bits of feedback from people who say, I participate in your program and I realized I was in an abusive relationship or I realized I do some of these things and I want to yeah. be better. So as compared to, so it was building just like uh, Michael J. Fox was. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a problem that affected a lot of people. This problem affects even more people. Um, but it was also what I, what had led me to left, leave Michael J. Fox was that I wasn't seeing the payoff. Mm-hmm. It, the timeline was getting longer. I knew we were making progress, but you couldn't see it every day. Right. With One Love, you can see, see the progress every day. Every day. Yeah. So like even like for my personal story with One Love, like One Love didn't even reach me until... So I was a freshman, so 2018. So it was like, I've never talked about unhealthy relationships. It wasn't brought up in middle school. It wasn't brought up in elementary school. My family didn't even talk about it because like, we didn't think, like I never saw unhealthy love really, like physical unhealthy love in my family. And so it was never a topic brought up in my, uh, like in my brain, like growing up, as growing up. Um, So then my freshman year, I learned about it. I learned about Yardley. Everybody was talking about One Love, and I had no idea what One Love was. Because you went to her high school. I went to her high school. Right. And um, so then that's why when I got involved, someone once said to me, and I think it was maybe at, like, the first summit, because I went to the One Love summit, um, you know, each person that One Love educates, like, that we educate, you know, because we were all there as team members, um, you know, we're potentially saving their lives from an unhealthy relationship. And so that, that's why I continue to do my work with One Love, but also realizing that, like, you know, I've been uh, unhealthy many times, like my friends, and that I've seen a lot of unhealthy friends, like, right. do things to me. Right. So it's just, like, um, you know, taking that realization on, like, this has been happening for such a long time, and it didn't even, like, I was maybe, like, 14 when I first learned about it. Yeah. So just thinking about, like, all the knowledge that I have now that I didn't have back then starting high school, which is one of the most pivotal times for a teenager to go through. Yeah. And I mean, I think the things that I love about what I love about what we didn't know, but I think is part of why it works is turns out everybody wants to know how to have healthy relationships and how to avoid unhealthy ones. Even people who do unhealthy things would prefer that they not, but they need somebody to sort of catch them in a space of non-judgment and just say, these are like, these are the 10 signs right? and this is how they play out. And this is what you can work on. So it's very specific. Um, I think the, we, relationships are actually the thing that we have probably all of us the most collective experience in. Mm-hmm. It's just like unorganized data. Yeah. So we process it in emotions. We store it in emotions. We don't We don't have like a, the right language mm-hmm. to talk about it. I do think the 10 signs have created that language. Yeah. And, and then the third thing is I think that it's such a stigmatized issue. We get so uncomfortable standing up for ourselves saying that didn't feel good. That felt like you were bullying or whatever it is. You know, that felt abusive. We don't know how to have that conversation. Mm-hmm. So pulling the issue into the light and saying, you normalizing it. We should all be having this conversation. Right. All of us need this. This isn't yeah. like bad guys and good guys. All of us need this information. And, you know, we won't reach everybody. You know, I think that um, some percentage of abusive people are narcissists. They're not going to see the value in this work at all. They're mm-hmm. not going to recognize its relation to them. But a lot of other people will have the potential to learn and then the pay it forward of, Anyone can learn to use these tools to teach others. Right. That means it's incredibly scalable. Like we've intentionally built our programs with the idea of how do you train a non-domestic violence expert to teach about healthy and unhealthy relationships? Because if you have to be a domestic violence expert, there's not enough to handle the problem. Right. And so um, that's, that's sort of what I love about it. And I think what's been great over the last eight years is seeing how the conversation has changed. So um, you know, the topic of healthy relationships, you hear that a lot now. The signs of abuse, you hear that a lot now. You didn't hear it eight years right. ago. Yeah. So I think we are changing the way. We're part of the group that's changing the way people talk about yeah. this issue. I mean, even today, like at NDP, when we did Sexual Assault Awareness Day at our school, like Denim Day, um, we sat down with like, I think it was three of us that planned that day, um, two other girls and then a group of teachers. And we talked about, you know, things are becoming so normalized that people don't even know if they're being, t- if they're touched in the wrong way, if like verbalized, if they're verbally being like abused. Um, and I think people, when they tend to think of abuse, they think of physical abuse. Exactly. But yeah. a lot of the time it could be financial, it could be mental, it could be emotional, it could be anything really. Um, it could even be like self in your own mind mentally. Um, so I think... You know, we were working on it and some girls when even like we used to show escalation at NDP um, and some people didn't take it seriously because they didn't realize how big of the problem it was like a couple of years ago, even after Yardley had passed. 
Um, and now people are like, this is just something that we need to talk about. And, you know, it's been great to see like the whole NDP community really like rally around because as like, I didn't know Yardley, but I feel like through the videos <coughs> of people, like I made a video with all the people saying like what they missed about Yardley when I made that. I really saw like Yardley's impact on NDP, not even just NDP, but the community around NDP. Um, and even in like Baltimore, like if you even just say like One Love, Yardley, like everybody knows the story. Everybody knows about, you know, the education that One Love's doing. So I thought that was really great. And that's like when I got involved, but just the stigma around like the silent epidemic, like I like that phrase because um, it really wasn't talked about and it was affecting all of us. Yes, um, most definitely. And even so, like, when it was a silent epidemic and when you were just introduced to when Yardley had passed, do you think when you were, when you had had previous work at Michael J. Fox, um, how am I going to word this? Like, that, how was that transition to something that was starting to get more, like, publicized, like, people were learning more about Michael J. Fox, Parkinson, Parkinson's, right. and now you're starting back at something that nobody knows about. Right. So, like, well, how was that transition? Yeah, I mean, it was like, there was, <laughs> I think that, in so I definitely believe, um, I believe things happen for a reason, not always, but I will say that I think I ended up at Michael J. Fox so that I could learn how to build something mm -hmm. in a place where I didn't have to drive demand at the same time. Yeah. So Michael, at the time that I went to work for him, I think he was the most trusted celebrity in the world. And he's young and he comes forward that he has had Parkinson's for 10 years. He's the nicest person you'll ever meet. Really good guy. He and his wife are great people. And he truly started the foundation because he knew when he came public, people would want to support him and he wanted them to support something that would help them. Mm -hmm. So he, talking to scientists, identified research as a real gap um, and he created the foundation. But when I started, so we could raise $5 million a year just because people loved Michael. Right. That was before we knew how we were going to do it. Yeah. And then as we built a model that worked, so that meant I didn't have to, I never thought I was a startup person. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to worry about my paycheck. I didn't have to worry. I was going to get paid. I could come experiment, learn how to build. I was deeply dedicated. I didn't know that I would have a second career here. I, I wanted to change the world of medical research uh -huh. there. But it was all done with some safety because it was a startup with Michael J. Fox backing it. And then once you have Michael J. Fox on board, you know, I mean, I said this before, like we could get the biggest scientists in the whole world to come to New York for meetings right. to advise us because they were like, will Michael be there? Like, like yeah. it, it, And that's just human nature. We yeah. could get meetings with celebrities, rich people, media. We didn't have to have a marketing campaign. Yeah. So, and we built something real. We built something real. We built something that's radically changed uh, the pace of therapeutics for Parkinson's. I know people now who benefit from drugs that were first funded by Michael okay. J. Fox when I was there. So it is working. It's just a longer time horizon. Right. So fast forward, I know that if I hadn't had the Michael J. Fox experience, if I hadn't known, seen how much money is out there in philanthropy for mm -hmm. important causes, if I hadn't built a network of connections that I felt like I could ask to back me, in this startup, um, I wouldn't have had the courage. Yeah. I also probably wouldn't have had the courage to start One Love if I knew how big it was going to be. Right. I mean, when I started it, I remember saying to my husband, well, we have one movie. We got to get it to as many people as possible. We'll be like 10 people. And now we're 48 people. And we have 17 workshops. And, we, mm -hmm. and everything. So I'm really glad I didn't know what it would have yeah. to be because I wouldn't have had the courage to get started. Um, but every single skill that I learned at Michael J. Fox about thinking and strategizing and building and trying and honest assessment of what's working or not, if it's not working, don't deny it, just fix it. Mm -hmm. It all got carried over to here. Okay. Um, and some of the, we were talking before we, about anxieties with public speaking. Yeah. Um, I had a ton of them when I was a new CEO at Michael J. Fox, I was a young CEO. I had huge imposter complex about, um, the prior CEO had been my mentor. She was amazing at the job. And honestly, that imposter complex got in the way of our relationship mm -hmm. a little bit. But, and it, mostly I would blame myself for that. Um, but because I had to be a CEO, I'd had to raise money. I'd had to budget plan and finance and build a board and work with accountants and public speak. I knew how to do it when it was time to do it at one level. Yeah. Um, so I would say that if I hadn't had the Michael J. Fox experience, I wouldn't have been able to do what we've done with One Love. Um, I think that the, it is, <laughs> there is a very stark contrast. Um, if you get Parkinson's disease, you get diagnosed, so you're told you have it, 
And if you're diagnosed back then, especially probably still now, you might look up Michael J. Fox before you look up Parkinson's on mm-hmm. the web, right? With One Love, if you're in an abusive relationship, you don't call it that. Right. So you don't get a diagnosis necessarily. Yeah. And because we don't have a big celebrity attached to it, you don't know where to go. So mm-hmm. we have to find people. So right. we've had to source funding, basically. And even when we when we started taking escalation places, it was literally knocking on doors, well, cold calling. You know, hi, you might remember the story of Yardley Love. We have a movie. That, lots of places said this, issue, this is, wasn't an issue that affected their kids. We're like, well, it is. You know, So there was this whole process of cold calling people, yeah. honestly, that we never had to do at Fox. But... In some ways, I'm so glad because um, if we had just had somebody drop, if we had a celebrity attached to this, we wouldn't have had the pressure, we wouldn't have the confidence maybe to understand how much people were really liking what we were selling. Okay, yeah. Because what we couldn't, we used to say, nobody, once people know One Love, they love One Love. Like our conversion rate with people once they experience the programs Mm -hmm. or make a gift is really high. Like, the, but too many people don't know us still. Yeah. So, but we're getting there. Yeah. So how was that mentally when you were, you know, going out telling people about one love and people were like, no, this isn't an issue. But, and then how was that trying to like kind of persuade, not persuade, but educate people that literally were closed off to the idea of unhealthy relationships? Well, I would say in the first year, there was a couple of things that happened that helped. And I, I say this, it helped one love. It is unfortunate for Ray Rice that the crisis in, in the video camera mm-hmm. of him assaulting his wife happened, but it happened right when I took over, which meant the news was talking about this issue, which meant we could get in with the Ravens, who are our first right. major supporters yeah. and have been loyal and steadfast ever since, incredible supporters. Uh, we could get in with the NFL Foundation and some big funders who'd never invested in this area before, but who knew me from my time okay. at... Fox were like, oh, you know, we'll take a gamble. We'll take Mm -hmm. a gamble on you. Um, So that helped because now we had some money. So so then it was about building the team. And we used to say, you can't drag a horse to water. We got to do our best to try to make this compelling and then go where the energy is. When we find an ally at a school, like lean in, get their help, start building that network. Um, The the hardest, I I think that (laughs) it might be one of the things I'm I'm most proud of now is we don't have to sell this issue anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like a radical difference. And it's not because people know one love. It's because people understand that relationship health matters. Yeah. People understand that relationship health is a root cause issue. So if we have improved relationship health, we'll not only have lower domestic violence, we'll have improved social outcomes. We'll have, there's a whole cascade of things that happen. Um, And people see the tie between relationship health and mental health. And there's a lot of different, it's not just because of our work, but the progress in terms of socializing the issue in a relatively short amount of time. I mean, eight years is a long time, but it's also, you know, if we, if, if the original model was to do what Mothers Against Drunk Driving did, you know, over the course of 30 years, MAD and other advocates in the space caused deaths by drunk driving to decline by 50%. Oh, wow. Um, if you want a really weird fact. So that was Sharon yeah. Love's um, North Star. Okay. So if we could do the same, we're eight years into 30 years. What if we could do the same? What if right. one in three women could become one in six? Right. That would be amazing. Yeah. And you think of the ripple effect of that. So it's, yeah. like, it's not, you can affect individual lives in the moment, but the, the real stats change takes yeah. time. So what I was going to say, so um, when I was doing research a few years in about what exactly did Mothers Against Drunk Driving do to be effective, um, the woman who started MAD, her daughter had was killed on May 3rd, 1980, which is 30 years to the day before Yardley was killed. Mm -hmm. And I was like that, I called Sharon Love and I said, did you know this? She said, I had no idea. So I'm convinced that um, I look for little signs like that. I'm very much, I believe there's an army of angels helping us Mm -hmm. make this work. Um, But that's sort of the goal is to get to that kind of change. That's really great. Cause to think about like, like, I know we're right now one love. Like, we're thinking about the individual person, even, like, me personally. Like, even doing this podcast, like, and all the listeners, even if they didn't know what one love was. But, like, as we start to um, educate this person, this group of people, this school, this city, this state, and even if, hopefully, I hope one day one love goes international, I know it will. It is. Um, it is. Is it actually? Yes. So 47% of our web traffic is international. Oh, my goodness. Yes. I didn't know that. And more than that, there are... 
uh, one of our new board members who just joined, she is leading our work to bring it to Bermuda. She's oh led like goodness. mass trainings there. And two nonprofits have started, Let Me Know in the UK uh, and Amor Del Bueno in Mexico to bring right. the 10 signs and this model, this approach. How's that been? It's great. With like- and and we, it's it's awesome. The vision, we don't have, it doesn't have to be a one love entity. We just yeah. need to partner. And it's, yeah. I think what the vision would be like, wouldn't it be amazing if one day there's like little satellites all over the world that are that are making that are adapting the education for their country, their their young Area. people, but it's all the same backbone oh. of the ten signs. So um, that's so cool. I didn't know that. Yes, I did yes. not know that. So all now fifty states in the world. Yeah, <laughs> that exactly. is so awesome. Um, so now I want to talk about your role as a mom, real quick. Yeah. So your mother of four, which yep. I just found out, but. How has that been like when you started One Love and how has that like just had a kid and now you're put to, stepping your toes into something that you haven't done before? How is that like being a CEO and a mother at the same time? Well, I remember, so keep in mind, I left Michael J. Fox in 2011. And when I left, I am being really honest with you. I was like, so that's it. Like, that was my career. <laughs> I really was. I remember being, when I went in to resign to Michael, which was really hard. When I got out into the cab, our head of marketing called and said, oh my gosh, congratulations. You just got, you know, Crane's 40 under 40, which is like in New York City, a big deal. Oh my goodness. And I said, okay, let me call you back. And I just sobbed in the cab. I was <laughs> like, and now I'm leaving and I'm going to be a stay-at-home mom. Um, and again, like questions about worth. Like maybe I was just successful because Michael J. Fox was running this or that. So like, yeah. you know, I think the best thing about getting older is you sort of shed that, you realize actually – it's it's the imposter complex, at least for me, has gone away a lot. Yeah, but, um, that's good. So I left in 2011, and from 2011 to 14, I really was around with my kids, teaching this class once a week at Duke for a few semesters. I had a fourth child um, during that break. Um, but I was starting to get ready to work again. And mm-hmm. my husband, I will say, has always been super supportive of that's that. That's good. He's that's like, great. help hire help that you need. Like, you should be working. You know, yeah. he's always been one of my biggest allies. But um, – and then this felt very serendipitous. I'd started to look for a start. I knew I wanted to start up. Yeah. Um, I just like building things. And I had started interviewing for a job in the women's heart health space. And I was always really excited when I was talking to them about it. But then I would walk away and I'd be like, I'm not sure I want to be a medical. I don't, want to, I don't know if I want to be in the disease world anymore. Mm-hmm. And right at that time is when I saw Escalation. And I said, you guys should hire a CEO and take this national and not in a million years did I think it would be me because the family was in Baltimore. Yeah. And they're like, what if we let you build it out of New York? And I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> so so that was just fun. Like, yeah. I mean, you know, I had a six-month-old at the time. Uh, or was she a year? She was a year. She was just a year. Um, but I, the office is in my town. So my kids could come by after school. Like, we have so many pictures of Esme at one years old, like, on the keyboard oh, in, like, so this cute. sparse little office where yeah. we're, we had, like, one printer and one mini fridge and it was pure startup. I mean, we yeah. were, we were, it, I love those days. It was like, there was no infrastructure. It was just like, let's do it. And yeah. I, I worked with a lot of young people out of college who were just like so idealistic about what we were going to do together. Um, so in general, it was, it was awesome. And it didn't feel like I hadn't done it before. So I will say that I remember being confident that I knew how to do this. Mm-hmm. Like I've, when I left Michael J. Fox, I think it was a 40 or $50 million a year organization. Like I knew how to run an organization and I also knew that they didn't. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to help the family honor Yardley. I really felt they had come up with a solution that deserved a test. Right. And so for me, it was like, all right, let's do it. Let's see if we can do it. And I think the biggest anxiety points for me have come when I think the vision is too big is bigger than my ability to raise money for it or build support mm-hmm. for it. So I did a few years in, literally <laughs> got to a point where um, I was crying in donor meetings. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, you need to take some time <laughs> off. You're a little stressed. Um, but One Love really had become something I just wanted to see be a reality in the world, and I was yeah. just tired. So I did take a month off then and when I uh, and really pulled away. And – came back really rejuvenated. Like, you know, this is what I want to do. There's no other job that I want. Mm -hmm. It's like the world needs this. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it brings out the best in people when they're involved with one love. So at a time where there's so much like darkness and things to be disappointed in, like, why wouldn't you want a job 
I will also say that if you're a jerk, you don't value in love. Therefore, you don't work here. You're not a donor here. So I don't have to, I don't have to engage with jerks that much. So it's like, because you've created this team and even like, I can like, like, like attest to this, that like each person is filled with so much energy and so much light. And like, even walking to this office today, everybody's face is like, we're like, like happy to talk. And it's just like, that's why you're all, you know, your people are your brands. Like one love is so like they're welcoming of everybody. So like, even like coming to this office, everybody is what you would think one love Oh, team with well, I mean, that matters so much. And now it doesn't mean we don't have problems. Right. It doesn't mean we're not all like type A's trying to get our stuff done and we yeah. get stressed out. And sh- but, but honestly, the heart, people's hearts are really tied to this work, which is awesome. So for my kids, back to my kids, I, in fact, ironically, my daughter, um, who is a sophomore now, uh, well, it's, it's a joy to me. My kids were uh, 9, 7, 4, and 1 when I started. Okay. And now they're 17, 15, 12, and 9. My my daughter did one of the One Love leadership camps yesterday, so cool. and I I didn't ask her too much about it because it's got to be her thing. Yeah. But at the end, I said, you know, I, I said I just have to let you know somebody on my team slacked me and said that you were making some really insightful comments. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> and she said, um, she said, well, I did make a comment where I said. Listen, my mom works there. I've sort of grown up with this my stuff. mom. Yeah, like <laughs> she said, I didn't see you the CEO or anything. But but um, she's. I, I think that it has infiltrated how we uh, engage as a family. Yeah. Like in the TED talk, I talk about like my kids throw around that's love, that's not love. Like yeah. this conversation, the, the ability for me, oh my gosh, it's improved my ability to be a good parent because I still make mistakes, but I know to go apologize and fix it. And in modeling that, hopefully I'm teaching my kids the same thing. We'll right. see. You never know. But, um, and one love is, has such a community piece of it. Like, they love wearing the gear. They love that so many kids at their yeah. school wear the gear. They feel like uh, it's, they feel really proud. Yeah, they're proud. This is what we do, yeah. you know? And so um, it's very, I found that this job in a lot of ways is so aligned with parenting. Yeah. So it doesn't feel like I'm living in two different worlds. Yes. Yeah. And then how is like, so I imagine like you're balancing a bunch of things at once. How is it balancing time with being a mom and then CEO as well? Well, I was always really good at, when I was at work, I was at work. And when I was home, I was at home. And yeah. then COVID really threw oh, me that's on my cool. butt. Oh. Like it just, I could, I work and home were the same place. I got really depressed in COVID mm-hmm. actually. I just could, I couldn't figure out how we were going to pivot as an organization um, during a time where you couldn't do as much in-person yeah. work, which was like our bread and butter. But also I was like, I had a child in kindergarten and third grade and, and a high schooler wasn't doing his work. And it was just, it was yeah. like too much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I would say is my spite, my secret weapon all along has been I'm, I'm super efficient. So when I put my head down and start doing work, I can get a lot of stuff done. Mm-hmm. But when I go, when I go home, I'm a hundred percent with the kids. Oh, that's way. great. So, yeah. so that changes a little as they get older. Cause they don't really want to spend as much time with me. I mean, they, they, they like to be in their rooms, you know, watching videos or listening to music. Um, so I have more time. So mm-hmm. I do do more work at home now, yeah. but, um, the, I do, what I will say is, um, I think my kids have definitely learned and I'm not saying this like in a talk bad about myself way, but I drop the ball all the time. I forget class trips. I forget to send in an EpiPen. I forget to schedule something. And, um, but I also don't forget a lot of stuff. And I think they've learned to be a little bit more flexible and they don't really hold it against me, which they probably could, but yeah. So what would your advice be to moms that think, you know, like are tr- that are working moms trying to balance, you know, mom life and work life at the same time? I mean, there's a couple things. One is I think it makes it a lot easier when you really love your job because then it makes it worth it to have to carry all this. This other, It's a lot. If you don't love your job, it can be a drag. So when I come to work, for the most part, I love my job. I get energy from it. So I'm not coming home like depleted. So right. that's the kind of job that you have. Make yeah. sure it's one that you really love. Um, I would say my have a a really realistic. I heard once that uh, moms of four are happier than moms of three, <laughs> because when you have four, you completely give up on any idea of perfection. Yeah. Like you're so outmanned, <laughs> but in some ways it releases you from the yeah. stress. So I think that idea that like don't expect to be perfect in either place. Um, I think I do think prioritizing, not missing things. Like when I when my when I was at Michael J. Fox, I was flying around here, there, and everywhere, and I was, like, missing my son going to therapy appointments. And yeah. while some of that is necessary, you know, my babysitter now takes my daughter to speech therapy or mm-hmm. to dentist appointments, 
like be there for the important things yeah. and, and always pick up the phone if they're calling. Mm -hmm. um, and then for me, my girlfriends have been incredible. Like mm -hmm. I have like an army of moms who don't work near where I live who will be like, hey, by the way, tomorrow's the X, Y, Z. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, like <laughs> they're looking out for me. And then I have an, ar an army of like working mom friends who were all wrestling through trying to manage it all. Yeah together. So being really honest about the struggles versus trying to like put on a mask that it's all yeah. just perfect. Well, I see that a lot in my family. So my parents very believe, like they believe wholeheartedly that you should love what you do. Yeah. Like if it, like even with us at me and my twin sister going to college, they're like, okay, you're not going to figure it out right now. And that's a question I was going to ask you later about, you know, if you know what you wanted to do. Um, but they're like, you're not going to figure it out right now. But once you realize like what you value as a person and what your top um, qualities are and how you can use your qualities that God's given you to really affect the world, change the world, 100%. transform the world. Um, that's where you're going to really see yourself strive because like my parents coming home from work. So my mom, her job got moved um, to virtual ever since COVID. So still virtual, like a lot of the time. So sometimes she'll just go out of the house just to get out of the house and do work just to get out. And then my dad also works at um, home as well in his office at home. But even like they'll be coming upstairs because we wouldn't we'd be at school and we'll I, we'll be getting home they'll be getting done work they'll come upstairs and they're like screaming like my mom will turn on like country music or like pop, <laughs> some kind of pop Dua Lipa Lizzo song that she's into <laughs> and my dad's like singing which is not pleasant but I love it <laughs> and so like so I connect that with my family because it's like they my parents have found what they love to do my dad has you know d come such a long way my mom as well um, in like creating where he was, you know, in high school and now what he's doing as a person, what, like what he's contributing to our family, what he taught me and Mackenzie and what my mom has taught me and Mackenzie as well. Um, it's just, they found what they love to do. So now it's like showing us that, you know, there will be one day, whether the job's not out there yet, there's going to be a day that we really love what we're going to do because, you know, our parents have so, like taught us this. Yeah. At such, I mean, such a young age. I always say like, you know, do what gives you oxygen. Mm -hmm. Like your job, if you have a job that feels like it's depleting you of oxygen, it's going to deplete you generally, right? Yeah. And my favorite quote is actually um, by Howard Thurman. It's, you know, don't ask what the world needs and go do that. Ask what makes you come alive and go do that. Because what oh, the I world needs is more people who are alive. Yeah. And I do think that, I do believe that I'm fairly, very faithful. I think we are all specifically intended and mm -hmm. part of our journey in life is to figure out why, yeah. like what's our unique thing that we're here for. And if we can find that it's almost, I don't want to say like, it's always an easy path to get yeah. there. It's not. And it doesn't mean once you're there every day is easy, but you found the place that you like the puzzle where you fit into the big puzzle. Yeah. Um, so isn't that, that such a fulfilling thought? Like something that like I literally will, could talk about for hours is that, you know, think of all like the, impact of a decision and like I truly believe that God has like you know nudged me here and there to make a like a decision left or right and I think so like even going to NDP like what has going to NDP led me right I got involved with one love I met you I met all the all my best friends I met you know Catherine Miller I you know somewhat I believe that if I didn't go to NDP, I wouldn't have started the podcast. I wouldn't right. have ran Chicago. And now, so that's like that idea of like, oh, what's coming up next? Because if I would have told myself that when I was like 13, I would have never believed that I'd be here interviewing someone for a podcast because I was right. so scared of public speaking. Right. So like now going to Alabama, I'm like, let me think about like all these things that God has really made me realize what my key things are that I value. What are my, the qualities that I see in myself? And if I'm able to see it in myself, then have hope for like, so, like, people are like, are you nervous for college? I'm actually a lot more excited than sad or nervous because what am I going to gain from that experience, right? So, like, even with you deciding to come to One Love, like, like I don't want to speak for you, but, like, the idea of, like, oh, where is this going to go from years from now? We don't know. And it might be a yeah. scary thought, I can imagine. But, like, I just find that so, like, a, like an idea that I could, like, talk about forever. I agree. I mean, I think, like, we sometimes... Um, First of all, your path, you, you just have to keep paying attention about, I call it gut instinct, but like is what's going to be right for me and getting to know yourself early in your career and then making choice. Like when I left Goldman Sachs, everybody thought I was crazy. Mm -hmm. They were offering me a third year to go international and more money than whatever. And, and I was like, I can't do it. I just can't. And I remember my younger brother who was in like junior year in high school was like, you're crazy. This yeah. is the craziest thing I've ever heard. So you have to have the courage to make decisions that don't make sense to other people mm -hmm. who are operating against a different like um, set of what success looks like. Mm -hmm. But I also think, you know, if you look at my path, 
your NDP example is good. Like it's like a, I did this and then all of this stuff has opened up. Mm-hmm. And I have that same view. However, I then made some mistakes. So right. I took some steps where I was like, oh, oh, yeah, oh, you know, like, and you can, that doesn't mean like it's all over. I mean, right. hop back on and make a change, yeah. right? So I think not expecting that Alabama will be perfect, but that yeah. it's going to be great. And, yeah. that, and expecting that your first job is your perfect, just yeah. keep trying to find the thing that's the better fit for you, right. um, for sure. I saw something on Instagram literally today on my on the train ride where it was like some people view success as and it was like these blocks. So let's think of blocks. So success as all purple blocks and failures at all blue blocks. But some people that are really successful in their own mind, it's blue and purple blocks. Mm-hmm. So so even though like there were days like that, you know, even during COVID realizing that I have like major anxiety about certain things and whether that was like you know, social media or stuff like that, or, you know, seeking validation from people. Mm -hmm. And so I failed in areas, even with myself mentally on like where I was leading my head and like what I was worthy of. But I also agree with you. Like there were moments where I was like, oh, this is not what I should have done. Or maybe I'm learning from from something like this, or this is not where I'm supposed to be or whatever it is. And then just having hope that, you know, and seeing where I am now, just like, I don't know. I agree. I totally agree with that. Yep. So I think it's like just a fifth, like I could literally talk about it forever. So now my question is a fun question. What is the day in a life as a CEO? <laughs> oh my goodness. Day, I bet it well, changes. I, it changes, of course. Um, well, it, it really does depend on what part of my job that I'm doing. So, you know, and, and also COVID's affected a lot. I yeah. used to travel a lot more. So um, going to different cities, meeting supporters, talking to schools. A lot of it is being the like, chief evangelist, even though that mm-hmm. word has like a bad connotation. It's like, who is the person out there speaking to the vision, rallying people to get involved? That's a big part of the job. Mm-hmm. Now that's less so since COVID that's done more in one-on-one zoom calls or, uh, but setting that vision and making sure that we're on track to get there. Mm-hmm. And I think also I play a big role here at constantly thinking like, are there things we're missing? Are there things we're not thinking about? Yeah. And I think also when you were talking earlier about um, it's this importance of developing a discipline around honest assessment mm-hmm. for yourself. Yeah. Like as you were describing, yeah. like, should I have done this? Am I did? But it's also for the org. So for me, I try to instill this value here is I don't care if something went wrong. Mm-hmm. Just tell me exactly what happened, how, and then tell me how you think it could be better. And I think that's an important role I play here. Mm-hmm. I find that, um, People have an expect, I have no expectation things will ever be perfect. So um, when you go in with that expectation, it's easy to say, oh, this didn't work. Okay, let's fix it. Right. You know? um, from a day to day, I'm in a lot of meetings, uh, sort of combination of internal and external. I've been working a lot lately on our strategic plan and uh-huh. really getting into detail about how we're going to measure success over the next four years. Uh, but I would say that I, I'm like the primary ev- evangelist and a big fundraiser. Yeah. Is the way of- and then like even going back to your you know role as a mom and I was talking about this when I was coming up with these questions for my interview with my mom I was like so for you have learning about the statistics of unhealthy and healthy relationships did that change your goals your perspective as a mom on like what do you know what I'm saying um yeah I mean I think I guess like I on your outlook on how you it, raised your kids I think it definitely has made me a better parent like I said I just think we all have unhealthy things that unless we actually reflect on them mm-hmm. and intend to be better, we don't fix them. They right. Be these bad patterns of behavior. So I definitely think I'm a better mom as a result. I think just parenting in general. Um, so you talked about my resume earlier, yeah. and I think it's really easy in a success oriented society to, Oh, my kids are so smart. They're going to go here. They're going to go there. Mm-hmm. That whole thing. And, I think the combination of my faith and this work paired with like just some challenges we've had on the home front, I really just don't care. Like it's not what matters. Like what Matt, yes, it matters. You feel it, you feel the pressure, but what really matters is are you going to the school that's right for you? Mm -hmm. Are you leaving my house liking yourself as a human being and feeling like unequivocally loved? So I think it's a combination of my faith and my one Mm -hmm. love work. That's like made me really like, I I probably was a person who would have been very prone to the rankings and the best schools. And actually, we left New York City um, to live in Bronxville because I was like, I don't like this preschool admissions process. I'm going to get crazy. (laughs) So I was like, can we just go somewhere where I can just sign them up? So 
I know that about myself. Yeah. But, but something in me has fundamentally changed since then where mm-hmm. I just, I've just dialed it back and it's, um, it's much more of a focus on, I do believe you can't do this healthy and unhealthy relationship work and not like see how critically important social emotional health is right. and well being. Mm-hmm. And my goal that my kids will evolve with that intact, with their self esteem intact, that's mm-hmm. like the number one thing. Yeah. Because there's so many things in the world trying to hack right. it down. And even so like I when you say like preschool admissions, like I can even think to like my mom's, like there were like days like so in elementary school you'd have to take like that like that t- every year test to see how the school's doing yes. on like educating kids. Um, and my mom literally would every, the night before she'd be like, Oh, don't worry. Like, just go yeah. in. If you don't know a question, just guess. Like, like I think the teacher once there was a teacher that actually came up to my mom after the day that we took it. Cause Kenzie and I were like just sitting there, like probably just filling in random answers. Like just thinking about if we knew the answers. Cause our parents were putting stress on us to like, Oh, you have to get a good grade. Like this was second grade. <laughs> so we were like little, little kids. And the teacher came up and she was like, no, your kids have like really bad attention problems. Like, I think you need to get them a pill. And my mom went to the school and she's like, oh, so do you tell this to everybody's, everybody's kid that their mom's doing their, like all the kids that the moms are doing their projects? Because she was like, they don't pay attention. Their projects are not like as good as the other kids. Like there's something off. My mom just stood there to the lady and, and she actually went to a meeting with the whole school and she said, do you think that um, all these kids are doing these A plus projects? Because I can guarantee you, it's their moms. <laughs> so my mom, like, like even from a young age, I've seen my parents. They're like, they have confidence in us, which right. actually allowed us to have confidence in ourselves. And mm-hmm. either like my parents had goals for us as kids, you know, whether it was like. Um, they never pushed us to like, oh, you have to make the soccer team. You have to make the right. basketball team. It was all of instinct if they thought that we loved what we were doing. Yeah. So I think that's great. I connect with you completely on like, I see what I see my parents have done it from a young that's age. That's great. You're that's so even lucky. like, my, me and my sister, like when we were younger, we would start like all these businesses. Like, I, like ever from, from a young age, like for one year, so right before I ran Chicago, my sister and I actually like started a Baby suit company. That started it, but we just, like, that was something we loved, baby suits. <laughs> and so my sister is very much the stylist one, stylish one um, in that bathing suit area. And so my parents actually, like, let us design. It wasn't, like, entirely, like, super expensive. So they were like, okay, let's let you take this. You're enjoying this. We, like, designed bathing suits. And then we realized that, you know, it maybe wasn't the thing for us. <laughs> but whatever it was, I mean, we were starting all these little things ever, from such a young age that, like, even, they like, supported you starting the help. podcast, like, who knows if, I, like, like at that time when I was starting it a year ago, I was like, okay, let's just try this out. Like, yeah. this is, like, what I value. And then now I'm here still doing it. Yeah. So it's just, like, the support from a parent. And even if, like, me educating them on one love, like, I feel like that's helped them a lot, too, on, like, realizing what we deserve as in friendships and romantic yes. relationships, but overall as a parent, it's just come like full circle for them. And I'm sure for you as well. So it's just like, it sounds like you have I'm, awesome parents. They're pretty awesome. Yeah, they sound <laughs> pretty awesome. Dad will come up. Oh, Last good. Time, <laughs> he'll be excited. Um, so do you think, you know, how is your, and so now I want to talk about how has your journey been as a woman in your position? Um, well, I worked in a lot of, environment well there's me now and then there's me when I was 22 Mm -hmm. where I was in very male environments right um and I remember when I went back to teach at Duke um I remember they said we think I thought I should teach a class on medical research philanthropy or innovation and disease research something like very like cerebral and this woman Alma who's another mentor of mine but wasn't at the time Mm -hmm. she put her glasses on her nose she's like I think you should oh no she said I think you should teach women as leaders which was a standing class they had, but I could make it my own. And I was like, you know, I just don't think being a woman has affected my career all that much. And she let me go on for a little while. And then she put her glasses on the edge of her nose. She's like, I I think you should think a little harder about that. Yeah. Um, So I ended up teaching this class and it was actually like, not only was I teaching, I was learning. Um, It affects you in incredible ways. Like that you don't even realize, but just, um, I always, I think that I always was, well, I was a tomboy growing up for sure. I was always, I always had male friends. Mm-hmm. I was very comfortable working with men. That wasn't an issue. Yeah. Um, but just the way I reacted to things, I was always like, I was a little bit more sensitive. I was a little bit more emotional. I didn't always, I didn't always feel safe sharing my feelings about right. things. So I think you just learn to keep that back. Yeah. Um, I think, I think often about credentials. Like I wonder if I hadn't, if I hadn't been a Duke and Harvard Business School grad, would they have had 
comfort making me a CEO at such a young mm-hmm. age. I don't know. Um, you know, I think credentials were really important to establishing like that I could lead. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in this space, the, the domestic violence space is a very female dominated space. It's a space I wish we would see more men's voices. Yeah. Um, but I don't hear, I'm like, if, <laughs> this is the most female dominated, you know, sector I've ever worked in. So um, I think that when I taught the class, what I realized is this whole thing you asked about with imposter syndrome. Yeah. I, it, it's not just women, but most women have a little person on their shoulder who's like whispering in their ear, you're not good enough for this. Yeah. This is a big mistake. You're going to look like a fool. And you really just have to, your job in life is to like brush them off, mm-hmm. to like know that exists, but not listen to it too hard. Um, I think that in terms of communication, I think. I think there are real differences. Also in terms of career progression, like I never really advocated for the next big job. Yeah. I would have felt so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and I think that there's just differences between how men and women work in the work world. Um, But I feel in general, I've had as many male mentors as female mentors. Um, And yeah. So you think, like this is a question that comes to mind. So like even when like I'll text you and I'll be like, the kitty hood because I just like I know you hate it but I love it because like (laughs) what I saw like I was reading an article the other day about like a um triathlon runner she said you know my job here is what I want to do is raise the bar for women on like what women think they can do and I want to raise that bar and then for younger girls so even like and in the note like that I wrote to you even in like watching you and I know that again you don't like when I say the kitty hood but I gotta (laughs) say it because it's all about you know, I have a lot of mentors in my life and I look up to them as like, okay, wait. So for like, even looking like we married me to you, I could be like, if Katie Hood, and we're very, we're different, but like we're two different people. But I'm like, if Katie Hood can become the CEO of One Love, you know, I'm sure I can do whatever. And even if you didn't go into college, like, and I was going to talk about this, even if you went into college thinking you wanted to go into the medical field, like yeah. that gives me hope and oh, like yeah. comfort in a little bit of way because like people will be asking what I want to do. And I'm like, that's okay. Katie Hudson, know what you want to do. <laughs> well, actually that's, it's, but, it's a very conscious thing for me because yeah. like every time somebody reads my bio, I'm yeah. like, Oh God, that person is annoying whose bio they yeah. just read, but I'm just like a normal person. Yeah. And it, so when I, I don't like, I don't, and I, even with One Love, I don't, I feel like One Love is the product of the community. Yeah. And if it is too much about one person, it's not right. what the essence of it's about. Yeah. So that being said, like, I love being a role model in the sense that by charting a path, I mean, actually, when I taught at Duke, I taught a two and a half hour seminar, which is a long time to teach when you're not an experienced teacher. So the last 45 minutes of every class, I would have one of my friends zoom in, Skype in at the time to talk about their career. Okay, cool. And nearly all of them who are doing great things now were like, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Or my first job was terrible. Or this is my biggest failure. Like, I think we need to normalize that idea that if you just look at paper at like the CEO, you know, Harvard, like you think that's not you, Mm -hmm. but it can be you. Yeah. it's, It's just... It's it's in each one of us if we find our thing and really go for it. Yeah. To find, you know, to find the thing that we're supposed to be doing. So yeah. what I don't like about the world we live in is that we focus so much on status and labels yeah. that it's not really about that. It's about like what's in the essence of you and what you bring out every day. So yeah. when you say the Katie Hood, I laugh. I, I always just mess with you with that. No, I though. know you do. I know you do. But I I because I don't I'm still like in my head, yes, I completely, I am so aware of all the crazy awesome stuff that yeah. I've been able to do with my life. I'm yeah. so grateful. It's more of a feeling of gratitude than pride, though. Mm-hmm. So that's, I think, the, it, I'm just so grateful I've gotten to experience and, and have an things. impact and do all these different things. Yeah. yeah. So, like, I can even, like, so before when you were saying, you know, finding what you want to do when I first was getting involved with one love and when I had made those videos and I tell people this all the time um I had a huge fear of so I have two things I want to talk about so I had a huge fear of you know seeking validation from those who were certified or verified whether it was on Instagram or just verified in the world who seemed like oh that could never be me that is like they're untouchable almost so I made a video 
And I went and actually spoke at NDP uh, event. And I talked about this. So when I made those videos, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna send them to Katie. I send them to you. I sent them to you and Sharon, Sharon Robinson. And I know you don't know like all like you know all the people that are at One Love. But I was like, they don't know my name. Like I'm just gonna send the email, and whether they respond or not. And I had this idea of like person, like me, person, and like the Big other lofty thing, yes. right? And so I emailed you, and then. I think you respond. You responded fairly quickly, and I was. I literally went to Dan. Like Katie Cud responded to me, <laughs> but then what I realized was that you know when we got on Zoom. Yeah. I don't know if you remember. So we got into the Zoom call, and I showed you. The, I shared my screen. I showed the video so during COVID. And you were and wearing the, and you were wearing the I was wearing the sweatshirt. I remember that. And you, so I showed the video, and after I showed you the video, you full on just asked me. You were like, "So how's school been?" And like I'm, I know I like like laugh about this now, but at that moment I was like. She's asking, like, so I didn't realize that, like, and it was a good thing for me to realize that, like, I was like, oh, this is, like, and I tell people this, it was a normal conversation, and now we have this, like, normal relationship, yeah. and so all these girls that are scared to, whether it's, like, to reach out to a coach, to reach out to someone that they admire, I, like, have this story because ever since, you know, that Zoom call and then email, like, me following up with you, I was like, oh, she wants, like, whether she want that feedback, like, I just want to be this, like, I don't know if you know what I'm saying, but you just became this person to me well you know I, what think, I mean i think that that is we get in our heads like who somebody is because right of their title or their whatever yeah and you just don't know and yeah. like you could have emailed me i was talking to one of my friends last night who apparently responds to every email in her inbox <laughs> every day and i was like oh my gosh no i'm i get back to people sometimes i'm right away and sometimes i'm really late and she's yeah. like oh my gosh doesn't that make them feel like you're not interested i'm like I don't think so, does it? But no. my goal is to be as responsive as I can. Yeah. But not everybody's is. Like, there's mm -hmm. going to be people. But what's the risk? Yeah. So this is what I was talking to her about. It's like, so you emailed somebody and they didn't email you back. So call them. Yeah. They might ignore exactly. you again. Or they might be like, oh my gosh, I've been meaning to respond yeah. to the. So just like giving people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And understanding that people are people. Yeah. And some people get caught in their own trappings and, you know, they think they're, you know, yeah. They're somehow any different from anybody else. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of people out there who understand that like the value of life is the value of your relationships and making time for lots of different people and surrounding yourself with people who have the energy, enthusiasm to step in and get it. Like that gives me energy. So yeah. like it wasn't me doing something for you. It was yeah. like I want we started this with a vision that we could get young people excited about doing this work. Right. When you reach out. I'm like, it's working. <laughs> like, so of course I want to talk to you. Yeah. Um, so, but I but, appreciate that. Yeah. So like even, so I tell girls that like at my age, because girls will be like, oh, I can never do that. But I'm like, like talking about taking risk. Like it wasn't really a, like I knew that, you know, this email was going to go to somebody, but I was just like, let me just send it. You know, yeah. she'll, she's going to love this video. I know like, you know, it's had a great response. And so I sent it and then, you know, now we're here doing the podcast yeah. and like, like talk all the time friends for life friends for life that's right girl <laughs> um and then i actually want to talk about so my college essay was all about like a blue check mark so you know the blue check mark on instagram that some people have so it's all about seeking it was all about my personal story with seeking validation and so so i would view this blue check mark when i started social media as like untouchable i used the word untouchable these people were untouchable and i was never going to achieve the success that these people have achieved so even like with my other um, podcast host, Adriana Caring, you know, whether she was verified, I reached out to her and she responded back and we had an interview just like this. And it's also that why I'm doing this podcast. It's like whether I give, you know, a voice to people that I believe have a story that need to be heard. And if they're not verified, then they're not verified, but they still have a story that is worthy of being heard. So I still do take that thought into a, I take that like into account a lot because mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, okay, well, people might see, like, I want people to not see me as, like, oh, they, like, younger grades. Like, these freshmen at NDP wrote us a, a senior letter, and they were like, I know we never said hi in the hallway, but I would love to go to lunch in the summer. It was the sweetest thing ever, and I was like, why don't they feel like they can say hi in the hallway? Mm -hmm. So whether it was, like, I want people to feel like they can come up, and, like, with this podcast, they can talk to me and be vulnerable and authentic and real, and it's not like I'm, you know some famous person but i also just i feel like it's an everyday thing that people might be like oh they don't want to talk to me but really like i would love to talk to anybody so like same with my values to somebody else do you know what i'm saying yeah, definitely but i think we all do it like yeah. 
you know, I, I think that it's normal. I think at every stage of your life, and it gets easier once you get older, right? Because you're just older and you're, there's less uncertainty in uh -huh. front of you. But I think that's a normal human reaction. And I think being a person that can help, like, the more people that just diffuse that, who be like the power, the power of vulnerability and authenticity mm -hmm. is like unbelievable. Like being able to share a little bit, like when I speak and they, and I get introduced with my bio, the first thing I say is just so you know, when I was sitting in your shoes, I had no idea what I was going to do. Yeah. And when I graduated from this school, I was completely confused about my worth, my value, my this, my that. And People who were glazed over listening to my bio mm -hmm. suddenly go, oh, she's... Yeah, that's, that's exactly. That's how I feel. Like, yeah. So I think opening those avenues for people to know this is... These are common feelings. These are yeah. not just you. We tend to personalize our insecurity and think it's everybody else doesn't have it. And, and the people who are really accomplished definitely don't have it. It's not true. Yeah. So I think... I think the more people that really sort of model what you're talking yeah. about is, is the better. Yeah. And even like, and I do use that example because I think that was the first time, like when I sent you the email just of the video, that was the first time I actually realized, you know, like I'm, she's just like me, like yeah. an avenue, like we have so many things in common, so many things different, but so many things in common that like, whether you're struggling with anxiety or, you know, during COVID, like we all went through the same thing with like different things with COVID, but uh, like that was just a big eye opener yeah. for me that I can like reach out to anybody and whether they get back to me or not, it's going to happen. And you and should keep really doing that. Yeah. And not everybody will, but that's not a reason to stop right. because you're going to, you're going to end up with more positives than negatives. Right. So, and I think that's one of the examples of like, you have to practice that behavior Yeah. because it's very easy if you don't, like I can even talk about it like in the fundraising space, like say I send an email to like a potential supporter and they respond initially mm -hmm. really excitingly. And then I send another email or I call them and I don't hear anything back. I yeah. can go into the doom loop in my own head. Like they don't really like us. They yeah. don't really like us. So I have to be like, whoa, just stop. Just yeah. call again. Yeah. And, and, and I will ask people explicitly, you know, if you are, if you don't want me to harass you, I won't harass you. And they're like, oh, no, 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 I've just been so busy. So yeah. you have to avoid getting into your own head. Right. And that's something that I'm still like, even right now, like, um, one of my big mentors is a family friend of ours. Her name's Amy Larkin. And we had a long conversation oh, the other Amy day. Larkin. She worked for Under Armour. Yeah, she went to school with Sharon Robinson, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know I'm that. I'm pretty sure they went to NDP but yeah. Oh, yeah. Amy yeah. Larkin went to NDP. Yeah. So... Um, and I met her through NDP. And so the other day we walked, like we were just walk, we went for a walk and then I had dinner with her and her and her daughter. And before at dinner, we had a huge conversation because like I had this, I had anxiety and I'm still working on it, but it's getting a lot better on like, if someone didn't get back to me, I'd go down in that doom and I'd be <laughs> like, oh my gosh, like I'm bugging them on text. Like I'm not going to text again. Like what, like why am I doing this? And then I would send another text and I'm like, it's all this stuff that I was working through my head. And then I was like well, what am, like, am I? She's busy. Like, I, know, I was going back and forth with this voice in my head. Mm -hmm. And I would talk about this with my parents a lot. And she was like, Madison, you just got to realize that, like, you know, it's sometimes I'm just going to miss a text or your, the people that you're trying to reach out to are just going to miss an email. Right. And if you reach back out, it's fine. But don't don't apologize for reaching out. Because a lot right. of times I, I was, I kind of still am, but I'm, it's a lot better on it. I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, like, feel bad for, like, something I'm doing, even though – I'm not asking a whole lot and just like reaching out and saying, Hey, how's your week? And then things like that. So yeah. I think it's a lot to figure out, like still at a young age, like I'm only 17 and to figure all this out. But like, I mean, so. you're ahead of the game. Like it's, it's <laughs> everybody has it. It's much yeah. bigger when you're younger. Yeah. And then the more reps you have, like the more experience, the more, right. the more you get more settled in, in yeah. your rhythm and what, what, I don't know. You get less nervous about yeah. it. But that's, but what you're experiencing is what so many people experience. Right. Like, and that was okay. And she was like, you know, I used to be like that. If someone didn't respond back to me, I'd be like freaking out and I would like actually shut that person off. Like I would like shut down a little yeah. bit. And so it's just like knowing that like actually each person, whether they're verified or not verified, we're all kind of going through the same thing. We all have our own personal stuff that, yeah. you know, people don't see from the outside. So I actually do want to ask you that question. Like how was your mental health, your mentality during when you didn't, when you thought you wanted to go into the medical field and then realizing you did not, what was that like? You know, it's so long ago now that I, I had a really hard time when I transitioned to Duke, but it wasn't just because of the, um, it was stuff going on on my home front. And it was also just feeling like the tiniest little fish in a big pond and being very unprepared for that school. Um, 
So I would say I was pretty, very anxious and depressed. Mm -hmm. Um, But it started to turn around the end of my freshman year. I actually wanted to transfer my freshman year, but my grades were so bad I could not transfer. (laughs) Um, So at the end of my freshman year and going into my sophomore year, um, I started getting involved with things. And I still, to this day, I think doing little projects, doing something with a friend, like these relational things that are little, they're not trying to cure the world's problems. They're like, we started a little mentoring program for freshman girls. And it was a lifeline for me. It like, Oh, I I was finding friends. I was helping other people. Like, so I think, um, the transition of going to a school like Duke from a pretty normal public school at the one I went to was extremely hard for Mm -hmm. me. Like I just did, I was not prepared workload the way that, but I got, you know, then I found the major that was right for me and I found a professor who took me under his wing. And so it all was up from there. Okay. So that, and even like that story gives me hope and like, I want to go, like someone gave me the advice of going to meet and your, meeting your professors Definitely. because you have no idea on what they can offer you and then what you can offer them. Yes. Because they're making that one-on-one connection, still realize that they're human and whether they might want to talk to you, like they do want to talk to you. Yeah, you know, and Tracy you know. Broadhead, who's our California ED for One Love, she has three sons in college right now. Yeah. And she said, I told them they each have to find, they each have to find one person who's their person, an adult who's their person on the campus, just yeah. one. It could be a teacher. It could be an admin. For me, I had my professor and then the head of the women's center became that person. So I had two people that were like voices of sanity amidst all my insecurity and the crazy world of being a college student. And I think Tracy's right. I think that's really good advice. And at NDP, so I do like take that advice that your friend said because at NDP, me and my sister, we had... um, like when we were going through battles with like friends and this was a whole thing that we experienced our junior year, but you know, friends and knowing your worth and things like that. She was like, she was our person. She was like our school mom, yeah. school aunt. And like now we babysit our kids. We go over, she FaceTimed us the other day. It's just like d- knowing that if you have that l- little center, that yeah. little person that can be like just a comfort zone where you can just like rant to for a second or just like, Hey, I just need to talk about something or I need advice on this or totally. just to go say hi. You know what I mean? So that's really important to me and my sister. And I like that advice that your friend gave you. Yeah. So I only have a couple, couple more questions, okay. but I want to know what's in the, what do you think is in your future? Like oh. what is the future of Katie hood? Do you think? Oof. Um, I, well, I don't think I'll have another job. I think this is, I don't think there's, I, I can't imagine First of all, I'm really tired after yeah. building two things. So I'm like, <laughs> I don't have a lot of energy to build something again. And that's what I really like to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't imagine wanting to build something more than one. Yeah. So that's good. Um, I I have no idea. Mm-hmm. I What I fantasize about now is like what, what – I don't think I'll join boards. I don't – I think like, you know, manifesting, helping to manifest one love into existence yeah. is like – the peak. Yeah. And I want to spend more time with my friends and with my parents who are getting older, with yeah. my siblings, with my kids, with my husband. Um, I, I, I don't have a lot of that excess time. So yeah. I want to spend more time hiking. I want to spend more time walking. I want to, so there I'm, but, but I will also say it might just be that I need a break for a while. Yeah. Um, so I can't really predict. I yeah. have, I've achieved I've done everything I sort of want to do, yeah. um, which is an amazing thing to be able to say. Yeah. And I think I always just keep my eyes out for things that can be helpful. Uh, but I, I really don't have, I know I will not do another startup. Yeah. I know that is absolutely not a yeah. cards, So, But that might be, is it comforting a little bit? I don't know. Like, Yeah, it's seeing- nice. It's, you know, this is the thing about getting old. I dreaded yeah. turning 40. I'm going to, I'm 48 now. But it's like, there's something comforting about like, all right. I've done a lot of yeah. stuff. Now I can yeah. relax, you know? I mean, but also to see how one love, I mean, you oh, were here since the beginning to see how it grows and stuff like that. I can't even speak yeah. about how much I love one love. Like it's, it's just, it's such a gap. It is so important. It's been completely undervalued. This issue of relationship health or the problem of domestic violence. Yeah. And it is so fun to be like building a community, mm-hmm. which includes my team and you and board and, supporters that I mean we just tallied just tallied the numbers for this this board meeting come out since 2014 we've raised 50 million dollars holy moly towards this work oh 57,000 donations <laughs> like I was like I mean I should know that yeah right? but I'm like wow 
Yeah. Like building something out of such a horrible tragedy. Right. That we get notes every day, every other day from people saying, like, we just got a note from a, a sixth grade teacher who we just introduced a late elementary school, early middle school curriculum. Okay. Uh, the friendlets. Yes. And the sixth grader came up to her teacher afterwards and said, and she's in a relationship already, and she said, I think it's an unhealthy one. And she talked to her parents and she got out. Yeah. Like, okay. Even at that age, And then though. there's more extreme yeah. examples. Like right. the woman who emailed me, you know, six months into COVID and said, I just want to let you know I think about you every day. I saw your TED Talk. Your TED Talk was my most frequently watched talk in 2019. Yeah. And it gave me the courage to leave my abusive husband with my kids on March 1st, 2020. And I cannot imagine what it would have been like to be quarantined with Yeah. Them. It's like, okay, all right, this is, this is good yeah. stuff. And the great news is it doesn't depend. It, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Mm-hmm. Like as more people get engaged, it's very viral in its nature. Yeah. More people pull. So another note from someone who did our educator certification training, she said, my 18-year-old granddaughter was in an unhealthy and abusive relationship. She didn't realize it. The counselor at her school introduced her to One Love. Mm-hmm. And she got out and she's not suicidal anymore. That's great. It's like, okay. Yeah. Like this is, this this seems like if you have to have a job, this is like a pretty good yeah, job. Yeah, it's pretty right? good job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Plus again, the people who are associated with One Love are good people. Yeah. And so like my team, I, are the, the what gets me the most emotional, like we got, we gathered as a team for the first time in February for a team retreat, you know, since COVID. I looked around the room. I'm just like, oh my gosh, like how did yeah. we get this many amazing people yeah. rowing the boat the same direction? So, and there was, so that actually reminds me, I think I saw something on Instagram, maybe it was the retreat. Um, I was doing calls for Move for Love and I was like, just like going at it. And so there was one person and I, who, she just left One Love in like literally July 2nd, I think. Uh, Megan Gray or not Annie Megan Forrest. Gray, Annie Forrest, yeah. and so I'm giving my whole spiel, and she like is just <laughs> sitting there on the phone, <laughs> and she's like, like after I'm done, like I'm working hard, I'm like this lady, she's gonna come to me for love, I know it, and then she's like Madison, I work at One Love, <laughs> and but she was so nice because we had like a 30 minute conversation on the phone with a lady I haven't so met. Happy. She was so excited. She was like. I think I just got my first volunteer call. She was like, she loved it. And then I started to see names I recognized. Like, I think Shara was on one. And I was like, I'm just going to text her because she texted me for Move for Love. I was like, are you doing Move for Love? <laughs> and she was like, I was like, I don't think you're going to be um, in Baltimore, right? And she was like, oh, no, I'm going to be there. And then I saw her like Charm City run the next yeah, day. Exactly. Um, but it was so good because like even not knowing her, like, you know, like not knowing that she was working for One Love, she was so excited to hear my call. And it was just like, again, the people that I think of One Love, when I think of One Love, I feel think of your team. I think of the work you're doing. But like I have names popping into my I head. Know. That are, like, it's, so it's, amazing. it's a big community. Yeah. And like, you know, even today when I said um, a student from Maryland's coming up, the team says, who? And I said, your name. Oh, I think she was at this summit. Or like, yeah. it, it's very relational. Yeah. Shocking. Like, it's very personal. Yeah. And every time, I think what people don't really get is when we started, like, it was just an idea. Like, yeah. we could teach people with this movie. And then one of my friends who'd created the film Girl Rising, she was like, just don't launch it without, she, I remember the phrase, an avenue for their enthusiasm. Hmm. Meaning people are going to watch this film and they're going to want to know what they can do to get involved. Yeah. So that's where the idea of Team One Love came in. Yeah. And, but it was like made up on the fly. Yeah. So every time that we get validation, like you stepping up for Move for Love, you know, you reaching out, sending me a sweatshirt, like Mm. these things like matter so much. Yeah. And I think that's another important thing to realize. Like one of my favorite things to do in the world is write handwritten notes. Yeah. Me too. I love it. I love it. And I think it's just a moment that you pause to say, you know, thank you or wishing well or thinking of you or whatever it is. And we need more of that in the world. Yeah. Like we're all staring at our phones yeah. and like hustling from place to place, but like it is the individual relationships yeah. that matter the most. And I think where we can get the most positive. Energy. Yeah. So before I go to the next question, I actually just sent out like handwritten notes. Like I have a pin board on my wall. It's huge at home. And so what I wanted for like, so for at NDP, they'll do senior letters, which is like my dream come true. Because everyone just really writes whoever they can think of a senior letter. Like, oh. well, and someone wrote me this note. This girl wrote me this note that literally I had maybe almost every class with, but I would only like say hi or like hey and it had small talk and like just make jokes here and there. And she's like, said, Madison, you're maybe one of the kindest people I know. You are easily to light up the room. Literally crying reading the note because <laughs> it was something that like, 
I, who knows who you're impacting, right? And I yeah. didn't know that with this girl, like, you me as this. Um, and so now, like, the other week, I was, I was looking at the pin board, and I was like, okay, I'm going to send some notes. And I sent some notes to, like, girls that are, like, maybe seven. That I Some girls that I babysit. Some girls, the kids of, like, family friends. Some girls that maybe are struggling that have reached out to me. And, like, soon in a couple of days, they'll get a mail on the note. I mean, a note in the mail that... Um, just hoping that like, oh, they're like, oh, this person's thinking yeah. about me. It's not just a, hey, text. Yes, Which I, I think agree. is like more personal. I agree. So two fun questions to end it off. Um, so I once read that leaders are readers. So my dad told me leaders are readers. Um, and he heard that in, no, he read that in a book. Um, so I want to ask you, do you enjoy reading? If so, what book would you recommend? Well, that's so interesting because I, I was a voracious reader growing up. I remember I would like regularly during a summer in like seventh grade log like a hundred books read. Like yeah. I, my first job was at a library. So just don't even get me started. <laughs> um, and I have so much less time for reading now. Yeah. I just read though. So my, so my favorite book of all time is The Alchemist. Okay. Uh, have you read that? No. You should read it. It's, it, it is. <laughs> I need to write it it's down. It's short. <laughs> Hello Quello. It's very short yeah. and it's basically like, just read it. It's, okay, it's very relevant to the conversation going we to, just had. Yeah. Um, and I am famous for starting books and not finishing them now, which is, I'm actually, if I weren't working, I would read a lot more. Yeah. I also think the phone has given me like a little bit of attentional issues. So yeah. I can't like dig in the yeah. way that I used to. Um, but I love The Alchemist. And then I just completed my first book in a long time, which I'm a little embarrassed because the beginning part of it, I looked at my husband, like, you said this is your favorite book of all time, but it's like sort of like masochistic. I don't know what... <laughs> But only the first part was. Yeah. It's called I Am Pilgrim. <laughs> and it's this crazy, like, spy thriller. Like, yeah. Thr- and I couldn't put it down. I mean, right. I was, like, sitting by the pool. like, And I haven't yeah. been like that in so long. Yeah. Like, I felt like I was with my old self. So, okay. I'm going to read this book. So I hope we have this I would focus on the alchemist <laughs> yeah. more than the um, I Am Pilgrim. <laughs> but actually, I just, like, started. So for the, the longest time, I thought I hated reading. I was like, oh, my gosh. Just sit there and actually give my attention to a book. It's like the hardest thing because I was introduced with phones at such a young age. But recently this my at the beach, like a couple weeks ago, my sister bought like us a, a couple books and she was like, we're going to read. My <laughs> phone had died on the beach and I'm like, okay, I'm going to read. Like instead of like tanning, I'm just going to like laying out in the sun. I'm going to read. And it's a common book. It's and it ends with us. And it's about an unhealthy relationship by Colleen Hoover, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, and after I read that first book, which might have been the first book I read in years, I was like, oh, this actually is like relaxing like I can find you know like instead of a movie I'm like envisioning what the people look like and like yes. what the scene looks like and everything like that so I'm hoping to get into reading more so I'm gonna add that to you my list to read more. um and last question so besides actually two more because there's any, anyone but besides your TED talk which everyone should download I watched it the other day on the well I, I was not driving but I was watching it on our drive home from the beach the other day and actually we we're like it, had, it was like to the car it was connected to the car so everybody in the car was oh like, my gosh <laughs> <laughs> but they loved it because um, my dad's like TED Talk. That's amazing. Like that's like the ultimate goal. And I was like, I know. I'm gonna ask her all about it. Um, but how can people get involved and follow with One Love and what they're doing? Yeah, I mean, the thing I love about One Love is anybody can get involved. So um, if you want to teach people and you need resources to teach, you can go to our education center online um, and find those for free. And that's any person can do that. You can go follow us on social. We're going to be doing Move for Love again in Baltimore and Seattle, which we're very excited Slept about. Um, you know, there's countless ways to get involved. But following on social, sharing our stuff, mm-hmm. um, introducing people to the concepts of the 10 signs, yeah. um, those are all ways that you can get involved. Yeah. Well, I love it. And I cannot wait to get more involved. And I hope everyone that's listening goes and follows One Love and sees what the, all the great things that they're doing. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. This was an amazing interview, and I'm beyond thankful that I was able to come to New York and interview you in person, which hopefully I can still do as I go to college. Um, but my last question I like to end every interview with is that if you were to give one piece of advice to the girl who's struggling with self-confidence, knowing their worth, knowing their value, what would it be? Uh, I, would, I would say don't think you're the only one. So, and the more that you can share how you feel with a friend 
I think when you share your insecurities, people are more likely to share theirs. Mm -hmm. And then you find solidarity and then you realize you're not alone. Yeah. Um, so I think that would be the more you can take risks with people that you trust at sharing some of what's really holding you back, the better, I think. Yeah, that's great advice. That's Thanks. great advice. And just being all, like authentic, raw, like everyone just realizing that like we're all going through this together and whether our situations might be different, our personal situations, our home at home exactly. situations, we can maybe find one connection with one person. Yeah. here and there and if you don't well then you can learn about someone else yes you know? exactly well thank you so much for joining us thank this is amazing how fun thank you everyone and i'll see you later bye <laughs>